morning. Some of the teachers are. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So we should wait for us to be around 100 people. Yeah, 90 approximately. Okay, so let's wait another five minutes, perhaps. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, Ma Mario, can we Sam. ask a question to you? Yes. Just for clarification, uh, all the PhD students of the school will follow this. Uh... Yeah, exactly. Uh, not just. Uh, not CO2, CO2. Yes, this is a multidisciplinary event. Uh, so it's, um, you know, we are focusing now on the topics related with the CO2, but the. The, attending, the attendees are all the PhD students in the Okay, course. thank you very much. I've started the uh, YouTube streaming and uh, uh, I'll start the recording now, Elisa, if you want. Yeah, let's wait for another few minutes because I see people uh, arriving. Yeah, so before starting the recording, just let me ask you, um, did you encounter problem with the learning test? No, no technical problems, okay, very well. Uh, okay, let me start the recording. Okay, we're now 68 people, uh, Mario, you, you tell me when it's uh, time. I think we can start, uh, Elisa, and... Uh... So let me share the screen. Okay, so I shared the screen and then I shared this slideshow from the beginning. Can you see the screen? Like, yes. Yeah. Okay, good. So everyone, uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Elisa Giuliani. I'm uh, the coordinator of Curriculum 2, Socioeconomic Risks and Impacts. And uh, so I'm introducing this uh, module today, and uh, uh, then I will leave the floor to my uh, colleagues uh, who will uh, give like mini lectures for, for this course. Okay, just one second. Uh, we are now, so let me see how it works here. Just one second. Um, I see 71 people, so let people are joining. So let's wait two minutes and then I start with this. Okay, so let's start. I think it's time now. Um, so basically, uh, let me just uh, introduce you to the module to CO2, CO curriculum number two and uh, what it is about. Um, essentially, CO2 is about understanding whether and how economic systems are both responsible for sustainability challenges, but also can be functional to fix the sustainability problems and can resist, survive, transform uh, uh, themselves as they uh, address sustainability challenges. Uh, let me just uh, say a few words about what we mean by economic systems, because when we see economic system, we both think about some macro level organization of the uh, um, economic apparatus, thus uh, including the functioning of uh, the economic systems and the financial systems. But also we are interested in understanding the, the individual actors uh, belonging to these economic systems, so firms, banks, 
and their interactions with different types of institutional actors, as well as uh, the civil society and um, uh, communities at large. Also, when we talk about sustainability, we have to keep in mind that uh, 2015 UN agenda. So the word sustainability really refers to a wealth of uh, topics and, uh, and, and issues and challenges and problems societies and contemporary uh, capitalism has to address in the next uh, uh, decades. Of course, the lecture today and uh, uh, what you've seen so far also from the other um, uh, presentations from the other curricula is has a big focus on one of the most pressing and urgent uh, challenges, which is climate change. You've also seen how climate change is also related to uh, and interconnected with the other uh, sustainability challenges of the uh, 2015 UN agenda. But of course, here we have uh, a specific interest uh, in understanding how economic systems interact with, uh, are responsible for, uh, as well as survive and transform themselves in the face of uh, climate change. Now, let me just introduce you to the journey today uh, and therefore to the lectures. The lectures have been organized uh, across uh, around four key topics. And you will have a number of um, speakers for each topic. I hope it's not going to look too fragmented, but um, I, I feel that most of the um, lecturers and most of the professors in our uh, curriculum wanted to contribute, wanted to um, actually uh, um, have an interaction with you. So I, I, I thought it was a good idea to give all, most of them the opportunity to have a small talk today. So the journey is uh, first starting with uh, climate risks and particularly we're going to talk about physical and transition risks which probably you've heard about in the last days uh, too but mostly what we are interested in is uh, how economic systems uh, both macro and micro levels react to physical and transition risks we're also um, touching upon how um, you know the transition to a lower carb society is going to um, generate economic and financial risks. And we're also going to look at uh, and to discuss briefly about how climate change risks uh, impact on uh, the labor market. The second block is more focused on finance. Of course, you know, finance is a key component of, um, of the economic systems. And also finance has been associated and, and discussed about in terms of uh, how they can help actually address the climate change uh, risks. And so we are going to talk a little bit about sustainable finance and um, with some specific reference also to individual uh, type of financiers uh, like venture capitalists. And we're also going to talk about fintech, that is, uh, you know, the technology uh, side of the, um, of the financial market, how technology has changed the financial market, particularly how artificial intelligence has uh, generated market systemic risks, and also how that changes and impacts on environmental, social, and governance factors. And you will hear about ESG, environment, social, and governance, a lot uh, in this uh, um, module um, and also in the uh, curricula training because ESG refer actually to this, um, you know, the, the, it's, it's um, if you want, it, it's a business jargon for identifying the sustainability challenges companies face. Third, we are going then to move on from more macro level discussions to firms and to the business sectors. And we're going to talk about circular economy and green business models. We today we're going to talk about green startups, but also what is the circular economy, what it entails, what are the risks? You know, it's a very fashionable term, but what is really, um, you know, what it really means and how can we successfully become a circular economy through the work of companies. And we are going to talk also about voluntary ESG frameworks, uh, that is companies adopting a number of voluntary um, initiatives uh, to address ESG factors and, and, and risks. Finally, we are going to talk about sustainable mobility. Uh, sustainable mobility and transport of goods and people are key for sustaining uh, economic activities, as you can imagine, and therefore ensuring that we have the infrastructure that addresses you know, the changes and the transformation to a low-carb society, 
that reduces environmental and climate change impacts is uh, fundamental also uh, on economic terms. So this is today's journey in terms of topics. And these are um, like the speakers for each of the blocks, also with the timetable that have been circulated already. You see here we, uh, because of uh, like the length of the different uh, blocks, we have um, we are going to have like a break at around 12:30, and then we resume at around 2:30. Uh, so uh, we are going to have a different uh, schedule as compared to yesterday. Okay. So um, having said that, I would leave the floor to the first speaker. Uh, so I think it's Mario, and then uh, uh, the rest will follow. I will keep the time, and I'm not sure I kept the time myself, but I will try to you know be. Uh, to the conclusion, okay, so that you can wrap up and, uh, and conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elisa. Thank you. I'll start uh, sharing my screen. And, uh, okay, you should see now my screen. Uh, I will start giving you a, a panorama on in the context of climate risk and impacts from the perspective of uh, uh, modelers, engineers uh, like me, Francesco Balio, and Giuseppe Aronica, uh, we are uh, working CO2 on different aspects of uh, uh, the uh, risk assessment uh, um, exercise. I will first uh, very briefly repeat what is risk from our perspective, give you some reasons on why we need to assess risk, and then uh, uh, some tools uh, how to assess risk in the context of climate risk. Um, in the previous presentations, uh, you already seen uh, uh, some definitions of what is risk, uh, and uh, I'm going to just uh, very briefly repeat that for us, uh, the three main components defining risk are HUDs, vulnerability, and exposure. This is a way somehow to organize the uh, algorithm, the methodologies to assessing to, to assess the risk. The hazard refers to uh, the probability uh, ingredient because we go, want to know how probable is uh, the occurrence of uh, uh, an event that we consider potentially uh, damaging. Uh, second is the vulnerability, which actually assess uh, the relative damage on uh, a certain asset. And third is the exposure, which is the value of that asset. Because of these, uh, risk is measured in our model, usually using, using uh, monetary uh, terms, uh, and uh, it is uh, also referring to a value, a, a damage, a loss. For example, just to simplify uh, with very, very, uh, a very, very simple example, uh, if I want to assess the risk of flood, uh, for this house, uh, then first I need to assess the hazard. So I can probably say the probability of a flood is uh, at 20%. Then I need to assess the consequences in terms of uh, damages. And for instance, the damage of this house could be 30% because of the flood. And third, I need to estimate, given some criteria, the value of this house. And let's imagine it's 100,000 euro. Just uh, using the simplest uh, formula I can imagine of the risk, uh, which is the, the uh, product of, the three, of these three factors. By multiplying these three factors, then I get a value, 6,000 euro. What is 6,000 euros in the context uh, is the risk, which is the expected damage due to the flood. But why do we need to assess risk? Well, uh, usually we are, uh, very often we are in front of uh, 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 options. Uh, we, we want to choose between option A and option B, where option A, we can measure uh, the pro and we can measure the cons. Uh, and also for option B, we can measure the advantage and the disadvantage. And usually decisions is uh, making a, a comparison between these two options. And we usually choose the best option, of course. Uh, unfortunately, however, we face uncertainty. What it does mean that uh, for these options, it's not always possible to express the different factors with certainty. Some of those are uncertain. So uh, in this context, then, uh, uh, why we need to assess risk? Because 
we want to make decisions. And making the decisions usually means uh, compare, compare options. Uh, case B could be an option where I have all the information that I need, but for case A, probably I could have some of these factors which are uncertain. And risk is a tool, is a way, is a method to translate an uncertain but probable event into a measurable and comparable entity. So making decisions could be also uh, compare, not just two options, but also compare for the same option, the cost and the benefit. To go back to the example I was making before, if option, B, uh, option A is just leaving the house as it is uh, and the risk is 6,000 euro, well, uh, option B could be to make some works to reduce the vulnerability of that house and to reduce the vulnerability of that house from 30% to 10%. It means that they need to make some works for 3,000 euro. In this case, if applying the same simple form I showed with you before, I can reduce risk from 6,000 to 2,000. Well, I can say that in this case, I get a benefit of 4,000. So I have here now the uh, costs and the benefit of this option. I can put on the uh, weighting plates of the scale and say, well, the benefits are higher than the cost, so I can make now a decision, thanks to the risk simple formula. Well, however, besides the uncertainty, we always face uh, uh, some irrationality in making the decisions. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, imagine that you are participating to the lottery and you already won 10,000 euro. Well, now uh, the, um, you have a bonus and you can make a decision that if you leave uh, uh, this lottery, well, you get uh, 5,000 more than what you already won. Instead, if you want to bet again, you can uh, uh, win or not 10,000 euro. Same situation, but in this, kind, in this case now, you already won 20,000 uh, euro and now you get a penalty. If you leave, you need to um, leave uh, 5,000 euro on the table. Instead, if you bet again, you can probably uh, win, uh, you can uh, um, lose 10,000 euro instead of 5,000 euro. Where, uh, believe me, that uh, with these sort of experiments, although uh, by using the risk definition I gave you, the results in these two different conditions is exactly the same, well, decisions is, uh, the, the decision is completely different uh, because there is any rational um, behavior uh, behind the decision. Another, another uh, problem we face when we make uh, decisions related with risk is that usually uh, in the context of climate risk, we deal with rare events. Again, uh, let me give you an example. Imagine that you are sitting uh, uh, on, uh, uh, in, a, in a bus stop. And uh, uh, in that bus stop, we know that uh, uh, there are uh, different buses passing by. Uh, the blue bus with a certain frequency, with certain timetable, the red bus, and the orange bus. Now imagine that you set for a certain uh, period in, within a time window in the, in the bus stop. Well, by just uh, observing uh, uh, within the time window the buses uh, on uh, uh, that bus stop, you could probably conclude that uh, just three buses will go in that uh, stop. Unfortunately, however, there is a much more rare bus, which is the yellow bus, which still uh, go through the stop, but unfortunately, because it is rare, was not observed. So using the observation, for extreme events is not enough. Also, there is a four, a four keyword I would like to uh, highlight, complexity. Because in the context of climate risk, we deal with the complex systems. Uh, complex systems uh, are very uh, often uh, um, encountered in our analysis, uh, not just in climate risk. Our body is a complex system. The, uh, the, the hive uh, is, a, is a complex system, the urban system. Our society is a complex system, but also uh, our uh, climatic model, a climatic system is a complex system which means that uh, unfortunately the um, 
uh, the um, evolution of a certain phenomena and the uh, evolution, the propagation of certain perturbation of the system, of the state of the system, are very, very difficult to simulate, to predict, and are very impossible to predict just uh, uh, based on our experience. So given this context, uh, uncertainty, rationality, rare events and complexity, well, uh, to make uh, an assessment of risk, to make decisions, we need proper, proper tools. That's why we need models. Models help us to uh, solve and to estimate the uh, risk in this context. But how? do we assess risk? So, uh, repeat, uh, we, 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 um, we define risk in a very simple way as the combination of three factors, three components. Uh, unfortunately, the, in the real case, it's not that simple as I uh, said before. There are not just the three factors that need to be uh, to multiply by. But uh, uh, behind these, uh, uh, these component, uh, there are more uh, um, there are more variables, more uh, functions that we need to consider. For instance, the hazard is not just a simple number, is a, a relationship between uh, the intensity of the event that, I, that I'm considering and its probability. The vulnerability will be uh, um, depending, so the relative damage I can, uh, I can have depends on the intensity of the event. And also the exposure is a combination of different factors. So given this context, uh, even in a, a slightly more complex uh, way, so the risk is not anymore a number, is a curve representing the probability of different damages, of different scenarios. For example, again, let me give you an example slightly more difficult than the example I, I, I gave you before. So imagine that I want to assess the risk for this bridge due to landslide. Uh, well, I can apply the concept of the risk as before, but now uh, for my hazard, I have a curve representing different uh, probability for different scenarios, referring, for instance, to the intensity of the precipitation that could treat uh, the uh, landslide. Then also the vulnerability is not a simple number, is a curve representing for each of those scenarios the potential damage can occur or due to the activation of the lens light. And also the exposure is not that simple to estimate. I can use analytical methods or synthetic method to get an estimation of the value, but also more important than that, I need to estimate, to, to use and decide what is the criteria to estimate that value. Well, putting together all this information now, the risk is not just a simple number, is a curve. And of course, the higher is the damage and the lower will be the probability of occurrence. And uh, what we get is what we call the risk curve. Now we can have the full range of options and uh, scenarios with different damages. And there are different uh, metrics describing uh, now the risk. One of the most uh, uh, easy uh, of, of the matrix is that it's just computing the, um, the average, the expected value. The expected value of that curve corresponds to the area under the curve. Well, now I can use that number for my uh, decision-making process, comparing that expected damage with the cost. I can make simulations. I can do what I need to uh, actually make the decision. Well, all these things that I describe are a little bit more complex because I need to consider different things, but conceptually are the same in our risk models. I have a, you know, components describing the hazard based, on, for instance, on historical data, on predictions in the future scenarios. I have models describing the vulnerability by stressing all the assets and uh, points I want to make the analysis for. And then I have also the uh, economic component uh, trying to assess not just the, uh, the value for that access, but also to predict uh, how that value will change in the future. All these is embedded into a model. And this model will link all these, all, all these components to get at the end 
a description of the risk in terms, in mathematical terms, like for instance, using uh, the risk curve I was describing before. Well, in the context of climate risk, uh, I need to repeat this exercise, not just for one event, for one phenomenon, but I need to repeat for many hazards. That's why we usually call also our model multi-hazards. For instance, for flood, heat waves, wind, landslide, drought, extreme weather in general, and other natural events, I would repeat just by substituting to each of these components the proper approach to get at the end a description for each of these damage of the economic impact, the risk. Well, actually, uh, things are even more complex than I'm describing because when we deal with a complex system, there is not just the assessment of one single site. I want to consider the, comp the system as a whole. And the system as a whole is a complex uh, um, mixture set of relationship dependency between uh, multiple nodes, multiple assets. For this reason, I do not need just to estimate the risk, the impact for one point, but I need also to make a, a propagation, to simulate the propagation of the impact. Just to uh, give you an example, if uh, a, a certain event, a certain phenomena will eat uh, point A, well, actually, uh, there is a, a one, the first level of um, the uh, modeling uh, where in based on the intensity of the event will estimate the damage but also we know that uh, uh, a is providing a service or in any case uh, it will uh, give uh, an impact also uh, on b for instance thinking to uh, two different uh, enterprises there is a certain production that can be affected because of that level of damage and at the third level, well, given the reduction, the business interruption, we could say on site A, there will be also an effect, an impact on site B. This is what we call uh, uh, impact propagation and is also a um, uh, model by um, our tools. And uh, uh, we usually call uh, site A a site which is directly impacted by the phenomena and site B uh, a site which is indirectly impacted. That's why we call indirect impacts in most of our models. Just to give you a little bit of a, a, a view within these sort of models, um, we, we, we say, we always, we say that in our models, we go from a global scale to a local scale, and then we go back to the global scale. What I mean, I mean that most of the information on the input data that we need in our models can be uh, estimated just on a global scale. And the climate risk can be estimated based on, on the entire globe because the relationship between the variables are just at that scale. Then I need to project in the future, what would be uh, a certain scenario given some assumptions, and they need for that scenario to assess the hazard, which is the probability of occurrence of certain phenomena, for instance, extreme weather. Well, I need now to compute the damage, I need to go to the local scale, because just on the local scale is possible to estimate the consequences of, uh, of that um, scenario, that impact. Uh, talking about, for instance, the system of enterprises, I need for each of them to estimate of the different assets of the enterprise. So building, for instance, uh, machinery and inventory, I need to estimate the damage. And the direct damage on these assets has have an effect on uh, the business interruption of that enterprise. By putting together in a sort of network, the effect of this uh, um, domino effect, I can then estimate on, uh, uh, on uh, uh, the um, uh, country level or on an uh, administrative level, I choose uh, the, uh, the risk by assessing, using, uh, assessing it by using some metrics like uh, the expected value I was showing before. And again, I can go back to the uh, global scale where now I can make decisions and I can probably help to build policies. In the context of the 
of our PhD uh, in our curriculum, for instance, uh, we use risk for different applications. We use risk, for instance, for uh, planning. Uh, uh, there is uh, uh, Francesco, Francesco Balio, his team uh, um, that is working very heavily on these aspects. Uh, uh, to give you an example, uh, Francesco is working uh, uh, on the uh, Po uh, water district. Po is a big river in Italy, where is a very complex system where we need not just to assess the risk for a certain uh, dimension, a certain uh, element, but for multiple uh, element, for multiple criteria, uh, for um, uh, not just uh, the safety of people, but also for infrastructures, for the economic activities, for the cult cultural and environmental heritage. I mean, there are different layers we need to consider. And these, uh, because at the end, we need to pass, to pass the information that this uh, technical assessment to people where actually um, people who actually will make the decision, what we call decision makers. And this is uh, the basis for planning, uh, uh, very, very important. Um, a, second, a second application is designing, and there is the group of Giuseppe, Giuseppe Aronica, working very heavily on this concept because the traditional way of designing uh, infrastructures, uh, for instance, uh, uh, um, is a little bit limited to the concept of the hazard, is not considering risk as a whole. But uh, we are working on the definition of what we call risk-based design, where actually when we need to design an infrastructure on the territory, we do not consider just uh, uh, the uh, return period of the probability of an event as the input information, but we make already this cost-benefit analysis I was uh, uh, mentioning before, to choose the level of protection, the cost, the dimension of that infrastructure in order to optimize the cost benefit ratio. And the third application we are also uh, working on is managing. Managing uh, risk, uh, um, one uh, on of the uh, possibility uh, to managing risk, uh, very interesting now, for climate risk is, for instance, what we call risk financing. Risk financing is uh, to determine how we can probably pay for the loss due to the risk. A typical example is the insurance world, but there are different uh, uh, ways to finance risk, uh, thinking to other important components. Here, for instance, in, in, in the agriculture, the farmers are a very fragile component of the system. And by putting in place uh, um, models which actually can provide uh, funding in the right uh, time to uh, recover from loss will certainly speed and uh, let the economy, the local economy, uh, grow. Uh, these, in this context, uh, we are working with uh, some specific type of uh, of models that can uh, help in uh, uh, putting together the system. Uh, what we call, um, so these models are exactly the same I was describing before in terms of components, because we in, they embed hazard vulnerability and the exposure, and they are used both to assess the risk, so what we call disaster risk assessment, but also they are uh, real-time tools to pay the loss when the event will occur. This is what usually is called uh, parametric insurance. Uh, the key of the parametric insurance is that uh, an event is not anymore uh, adjusted by experts uh, in situ, but they are pre-computed by models, by computers. And for this reason, in a very short time period, we can get out of these information related, with the uh, related to the loss and related to the payout, to the indemnity that we can, in a very short time frame, pay to the uh, damaged people. Uh, the applications of these, uh, we made application of these in the context of, for instance, uh, agriculture, both for flood and for drought. And uh, this type of, uh, um, of model are also called near real-time loss estimation model, or also 
uh, weather index model. Uh, we apply that uh, also by using different type of models like machine learning, and we use machine learning uh, to identify the event for what we call index insurance. And results are really promising because in this way we can predict uh, events like flood. We can identify events like flood with 87 precision or, uh, or, for, or, or drought with a precision of 95%. Very, very good in order for, to, to rely on this type of model for, um, for making a payout for the financial market. Oh, but also we are using this type of model to predict uh, the yield, for instance, uh, due to the climate change and to the climate uh, um, um, variability of that area. Well, here I can show, for instance, the milk production forecast uh, in uh, the Dominican Republic, where we have the observed milk and the model milk. And imagine that with the, uh, about a uh, few months, uh, almost one year of uh, um, uh, anticipation, you can predict, and then you can also try to, um, to be prepared uh, to the loss due to the ill reduction of the, uh, of the field. Well, more generally, what we uh, can do uh, in the context of our PhD is to couple couple models, couple different type of models. For instance, uh, the idea, and uh, Alessandro Cagliani will, will talk about the, um, uh, these uh, in a minute, is to couple, for instance, climate and economic models, uh, considering the different uh, sectors of our economy and considering not just the direct, but also the indirect. But more generally, we would like to build what we call integrated models, considering the three components, the climate, social, and economic component. In this way, the climate part will uh, give the, the, the conditions uh, to assess the hazards, uh, the, uh, not just uh, the phenomena, but all the um, possible impact we have on uh, our economy, producing stress, and we would like to also use micro and uh, micro and uh, uh, macro and micro economic models to estimate the uh, effect. Also, there is uh, uh, he, here is represented uh, as a cycle because society itself uh, uh, can produce uh, can perturbate the climate. For instance, uh, uh, reducing or increasing the emissions. That's why this model is an integrated model. And just in the context like our PhD, we can put together all these components because we have this multidisciplinary approach. Thank you. And I would like to thank also Francesco, Baglio, Daniela Molinari, Giuseppe Aronica, Marcello Arosio, Luigi Cesarini, Beatrice Monteleone, and Rui Figureto uh, are working on this uh, uh, project. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you uh, also for being on time. So as uh, uh, Kayani uploads uh, uh, his uh, slides, perhaps is the next speaker, Alessandro. Uh, there are some questions in the chat. Uh, Mario, I don't know if you want to answer in the chat or take one. We have very little time, but uh, there's yeah. one. Uh, uh, I, will, I will answer in the chat. So Alessandro okay. can start. Yeah, okay, great. Some of them might, you might okay. have answered uh, already, but uh, okay. Alessandro, your time, your, the floor is yours. Yeah, just give me a sec. Okay. Okay, can you see my screen? Yeah. Or oh, I'm yes. still muted? No. Yeah. Okay, sorry. <clears throat> so good morning. It's a real pleasure to be here in this first multidisciplinary event um, of our national PhD. <clears throat> the lecture that I'm giving today is joined with Elena Pagliarunga from the University of Urbino, uh, who was actually supposed to, to give this lecture, but unfortunately some uh, unexpected issues prevent her from, from presenting today. So I, I'll try to do my best to keep up with expectations and, and replace such a, a talented scorer. But I have to say that I'm relatively novel to this field of study as a, I come from non-environmental macroeconomic modeling. So it's just in the last year and a half that I'm starting to deal with, this, with these issues. 
Um, today, in, these, uh, in the next 20 minutes, I'll try to give you an overview of the types uh, of the nature of the different risks that are associated to um, climate change. And in particular, we will focus on uh, uh, three broad categories that have been identified within the economic literature. So the first one, which is um, the one most investigated um, in, in, uh, in the literature is related to the uh, physical risks that uh, also Mario has touched in, in, in his presentation. So those risks that are arising from climate change itself, and we will see the different types of socioeconomic impacts that climate change uh, is recognized to exert on our socioeconomic system. And we will stress how these uh, uh, impacts are unevenly distributed under a number of the main different dimensions. Um, and finally, we will also stress the importance of um, accounting both for the direct impacts of climate change and for the induced, or if you prefer, indirect impacts. So uh, to go beyond the direct impacts in order to consider the overall cost of climate change. As you can imagine, understanding, assessing, and measuring in economic terms that is giving a monetary value to the cost of climate change is in many cases uh, a very tricky uh, um, challenge, uh, in particular for those dimensions for which we don't have market prices. Like for example, if we have to give a value to um, biodiversity loss. So we will see some of the issues um, that, that we have to face in that respect. The second class of risks uh, instead is, uh, has been investigated only more recently, but uh, is gaining importance and relevance in, in the last year. And it is related not so much to the conse direct consequences of climate change, but rather to the need to foster uh, a rapid and prompt transition from a carbon intensive to uh, a low carbon economy, okay? And as you can imagine, this poses a number of challenges for our economic system that are still heavily reliant on fossil fuels and on in general carbon intensive technologies. So we have different drivers of transition risk. We will mention some of them uh, ranging from technological drivers. So the fact that most of the technology employed in productive sector is still carbon intensive, uh, policy and regulatory drivers. So the impact that policies to mitigate climate change may exert on the profitability of businesses and, and so also on the price paid by consumers, for example. And finally, there, is also a there are also transition risks that are related to the change in the sentiment of both consumer and investors, as we are more and more aware of the potential threats to uh, the economy posed by climate change, and at the same time, more and more demanding as a stakeholder about uh, the responsibility of the businesses in which they invest or from which they purchase their, their goods or services. And to these two broad classes that are those you usually find in the literature, I also added a third one, which is often included in the, um, in, the, in the previous two, because it is inherently connected to both physical and transition risk and to the cost arising from these types of, of, of hazards. And it is the liability risks that basically refer to the problem of uh, identifying who is responsible or if you want accountable for this negative effect of climate change and of the necessary transition to a green economy, and then who should pay the compensation and the cost of the policies to take climate change. So as you can imagine, this is something which is almost impossible to do at the micro level, at the individual level. So if the value of my house, for example, is falling down because it is located in an area which is more and more frequently subject to uh, landslides or, or to floods, it's difficult to identify a unit responsible who should pay for it. But as we move towards more aggregate level, things become a little bit clearer. And in particular, we now know, for example, that uh, poorer countries tend to be, as we will see in a couple of slides, more impacted by the negative uh, hazards connected to climate uh, change, whereas we were those contributing the least 
to greenhouse gases emissions. So also measuring the contribution to greenhouse gases emissions and to climate change in order to find a regulatory scheme to split the burden of the policies required to tackle it is a, a crucial aspect. And the economic literature has provided different methods following different logics to measure the responsibility of countries, of economic sectors, and so on and so forth. So let's focus on, on the first class of, uh, of risk, climate-related physical risks. So starting from the fact that in a nutshell, we define by climate change, the change in the pattern of climate that can be more or less attributed uh, to uh, anthropogenic activities, even though this is well debated also within the, 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 the climate field. Um, but what is important from our perspective is that we have two dimensions of climate change. So we have both long-term and gradual progressive uh, phenomena and, and changes like the rising temperature, the rising sea levels, um, the process of desertification or the process of acidification of oceans. And these clearly exert an impact in the long run on our economic system. So think about the impact of desertification on the agricultural sector, or the impact that the rise of sea levels may exert on counties placed over the coastal lines of our countries. But beside this type of phenomena, we also have a change in the frequency and magnitude and intensity of extreme weather events. That means that the distribution of the outcome of climate is becoming more and more fat-tailed as a consequence of of climate change, and so even more unpredictable. And this second class is very important in driving the economic cost connected to climate change. So you can easily see how these extreme events, for example, a heat wave may affect, for example, the productivity of the workers who work in a certain area, which is subject to frequent heat waves, um, or how uh, floats or hurricanes can destroy the uh, physical facilities of, of companies and so hamper or, um, or, or, or corrupt their productive capacity. Or we, we, we may damage uh, crucial infrastructure like streets, for example, so preventing workers from going to work. Or in the case of desertification, we might foster outward migration flows, so impacting on the availability of the labor force within a country. All these crucial aspects clearly exert a huge impact on a country's economy, okay? In this slide, you see a number of uh, dimension which on such economic dimension on which climate change have been proven to exert a significant in a, a statistical and, and econometric terms impact. Um, so you see that they are very diverse and heterogeneous, and we have purely economic ones, for example, like the impact on the aggregate level of output, or on GDP, for example, or the impact on a sectoral output, like for agriculture or on labor productivity, but you also have social and political variables, like the level of conflict and political stability, or you have also natural dimension to which economists not, nonetheless try to give an economic value, like biodiversity, for example. And this, again, is very tricky uh, because we don't have a market price for that. But also biodiversity loss, for example, is included in the economic damages, also in, in the IPCC reports, for example. And clearly, the, the debate about the right way to measure them is far from being settled. So it's a continuous dispute about, about it. An important aspect connected to these uh, damages is that they are uh, inherently um, characterized by an intergenerational issue or, or conflict, if you want. That is, we, we have what in economics we, we call a trade-off. Um, maybe a, a more intuitive way to define it is a, a conflict between uh, uh, different objectives. So on the one hand, we have to <clears throat> bear today the cost for implementing policies to mitigate climate change, but we know that the benefits will only arise in the future. So we'll increase the, the welfare of future generation, not the current one, or vice versa. We know that if we save money today, not acting, then this will create a damage for future generation. And so this problem of taking into account 
in the costs that are have to be bar, uh, beer today, uh, born today, and the benefits that will only arise in the future. But if you think about it, also the damages that we are experiencing today are the result of, of past decision. So how can we discount, for example, the, the welfare of future generation? This is another hugely debated aspect. For example, in integrated assessment models that also Mario was mentioning in his presentation, and then are used within the IPCC reports and are used to define policies and also to define in particular the social cost of emitting carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And a key aspect of defining this cost is exactly how we measure the welfare of future generation compared to the welfare of current one who should act. Okay, and in particular, this is proxied by a discount factor of the utility of future generation. And there is a huge debate about the value of this discount factor, which brings very diverse and very wide approximation of the today's right social cost of carbon dioxide, which is crucial in turn in order to define, for example, the right level of a carbon tax. So as you can see, this is a very important aspect. And here is just the trend in the, in, the, in, the, in the emissions of greenhouse gases over the last decades, just to show that we have this right, rather constant increasing trend uh, and to show that the, the outcome of climate that we are experiencing today are already the results of decision taken in the, in the past, which is I think pretty intuitive as, as you can see. Another aspect related to the physical damages of climate change, to the physical risk of climate change is their uneven distribution also from a geographical point of view. In particular, if you look at poor versus rich countries. So as I was mentioning before, poorer countries are doors most vulnerable to climate change. And it's important to understand that the vulnerability or the, uh, the dimension, the magnitude of the potential economic damages of climate change uh, is a result of a complex system of the nations of different factors. It is not just the predisposition to be adversely affected depending on the features of, of the particular climate in a given region. Uh, so for example, the fact of being more or less exposed to floods or heat waves, it is not just the uh, features of the productive structure of a country. So the fact of being specialized in a certain sector rather than in others that clearly affect the vulnerability compared to certain type of hazards. Agriculture is far more exposed to floods or drought than manufacturers, for example. Um, but it also a matter of institutions, for example, of quality of institution and uh, of cultural aspect that overall determine the ability to adapt to the negative effect of climate change. So it is not just one of these factors, but it's the complex combination of all these aspects. And this is a crucial um, dimension to keep always in mind. But as you can see from this uneven distribution of the outcome of climate change, then it is also important to try to define the right techniques to understand the contribution of each country, for example, to climate change, to greenhouse gases emission in order to define regulatory schemes that can split the, buy, the burden of the policies in a, in a fair way. And so we have it within the economic literature um, different methods to try to compute the footprint of, uh, of different countries. Some are based on uh, production and emission of production processes taking place within the borders of a country, for example, in the Kyoto Protocol. Um, and some instead are based on consumption. So we look at the emission not produced within the countries, but the emission that are embedded in the overall production of the goods and services that are consumed by a country citizens. So also taking into account emissions that are produced abroad, but embedded in goods that are then imported in a given country. So this was also a way to avoid the so-called carbon leakage, that is country trying to outsourcing their emission rather than abiding them, typically outsourcing towards developing countries. And it is not just a matter of poor country versus rich country, north versus the south of the world, but it's also a matter of 
uh, but the effect are also heterogeneous within countries. So here you see some maps which uh, project the, the, the potential um, cost under several dimensions uh, up to uh, 15 years. Um, I kind of remember 15 years, yeah, in the United States, in the different counties of the United States. And as you, as you can see, in many of them, the most critical part is represented by the Southeast. And in general, this map show that it's, we, we can likely expect a flow of resources from the Southwest to the, to the North, to the Southeast, sorry, to the Northwest. So there is this uh, um, an even distribution of, uh, of the outcome of climate change also within countries. And as you can imagine also between different social groups within a country as poorer people might be less capable of adapting to climate change because they have less means at their disposal. And, and so they are less equipped to face the, for example, the, the impact of, uh, of, of weather extreme event. Think about Hurricane Katrina. Uh, for example, and the damages in the south of the United States. Another crucial aspect is that besides direct costs, we also have to consider the indirect costs. And this that indirect costs typically arise from the propagation of the original direct impacts of, of climate change. And this propagation mainly occur through production and financial network. So for example, if a facility is impacted and so the machinery of a, of a plant are, are destroyed, this obviously has a huge impact on the profitability of that company. And this will reflect also in the value of, of its stock. And so this will reflect also in the, in the wealth of those who have invested in that firm or, on, or, or the wealth of banks who have uh, granted the loans in the past to that firms to uh, realize investment that now have been destroyed by the flood. But typically they also propagate through the production network. And uh, here I put a graphical example of it, where you can see a stylized economy composed of four sectors. We have manufacture on, on the top, then agriculture, high tech services, and low tax services like hotel and restaurants, for example. And the green arrows tell us that every sector purchases some of the inputs that it uses in its own production process from the other sectors of the economy. And vice versa, every sector sell part of its output to the other sectors that use that output as an input in their own production processes. So we have this network of industrial relationship between different sectors that in economic terms is um, defined as an input output description of our economic system. And for sure, we also have every sector selling uh, their output to partly at least to households who uh, purchase them for consumption purposes through their final demand. Production processor, processes require workers and workers re receive a wage and income in exchange for the labor force. So now we can see what happens when an extreme event hit one of these sector. So for example, a flood eating the manufacturers, some companies in the manufacturer sector. So the direct impacts are first of all, a reduction in the level of activities of the sector of the companies that are hit by this weather extreme event. Some machinery now is broken and can no longer be used for production purposes. And clearly also the workers working for that company may experience a loss of income because they cannot go to work, for example, because uh, uh, a street now is flooded or, or because they, they no longer have machineries to operate. And so we have this direct impact. This sector is no longer able to provide inputs to the others demanded by the other sector and to provide consumption good to the household sector. But then we also have uh, indirect effects. So these unplaced orders to the, uh, of the other sectors may hamper their own production facility. Since now the other sector are lacking some inputs, they might not be able to produce their own output. And so this is a supply shock to the other sector. And um, at the same time, since manufacturing now has reduced its capacity due to the impact of this flood, and they are producing less, 
they will also order less inputs from the other sector. So we also have a fall in the demand faced by the other sector that will impact negatively on their production. And at the same time, the workers who experienced a loss of income in the previous step now may decide to save more and to consume less. And so this is a, a reduction of, of the overall final demand faced by every sector in the economy. So as you can see, these are second order uh, damages that can be uh, far greater than the direct damages called, uh, produced by, by the weather extreme event. And these shocks can propagate further. So for example, uh, if sectors that were indirectly impacted in the previous step decide to reduce their own demand of inputs because now they are all producing less, or if input shortages affect the productive capacity of downstream sectors in a more and more um, constraining way in, in the next periods, or if the workers of the other sectors well, has experienced a loss of income, for example, because unemployment uh, uh, has, um, has grown, are now deciding to reduce further their, their consumption demand. So you can easily see how the original shock has propagated throughout this production network, uh, feeding a vicious circle of both negative demand and supply shocks in, in the economy. And, and the magnitude of this indirect impact is as important or even more important than the direct one, okay? So this approach that we have just seen is called input output model. Um, and this is a technique that he often used also to assess transition risks. That is the second class of risk that we have mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. And as I was saying, transition risks arise from the fact that we have to convert our economies to, uh, low to low carbon economies. And we have technological drivers. For example, there is a huge problem of carbon lock-in since most of the technology in which companies have invested and are still using today are, are carbon intensive. And so this will is likely to produce stranded assets, stranded capital, that is capital the, on which companies have invested seeking for a certain remuneration over a certain uh, life cycle of the capital, but this life cycle now has to be shortened in order to abate carbon dioxide emissions. And so the value of the capital is now lower than before. And this is a loss in the balance sheet of these companies that can propagate both to, uh, through production and financial network. But we also have a huge problem, problem of sector production and employment reallocation, as we will see also in the presentation by Professor Olper. So production in certain sector will shrink or have to shrink in order to meet the targets of CO2, uh, uh, of greenhouse gases emission abatement. And so this will impact the sectoral composition of employment and the overall effects on aggregate em uh, employment are difficult to predict. Um, and finally, we have a very, very important class of transition risk, which is related to uh, regulatory and, uh, and policy risks. Um, for example, the uh, implementation of a carbon tax is for sure a cost for certain companies that may affect their profitability or in the measure in which they are able to transmit a desired cost into higher prices may affect the welfare of consumers. Um, or think about the uh, implementation of new standards of production uh, as far as emissions are concerned in a certain sector. This is going to affect once again, the value of the capital uh, in which companies has already invested. And so may give rise to stranded assets. So now the literature dedicated to find policies and regulatory schemes to foster not only a green transition, but an orderly, transition that is to minimize the magnitude of this transition risk is uh, uh, growing exponentially in the, in the last years. And it is important to, again, to consider that these, uh, the damages connected to these transition risks, exactly like for physical risks, may propagate both vertically through supply chains, that is through the production network that we have started to investigate in the previous slide, 
and horizontally, that is from the real sector of the economy, from production consumption, if you want, to the financial sector, to banks, financial institutions who invested in the companies that are directly or indirectly affected by transition risks, okay? And as you can see, all this presentation was geared around the idea of uh, finding ways to measure the contribution to climate change of different economic actors and measure the uh, dimension, the, 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 the costs associated to different types of climate-related risks. And for this purpose, we have a number of, uh, of different uh, uh, methods and models. So we have macro models like the integrated assessment models that are used for that are uh, models of the economic system, which include both a modeling of the relationship between the economy and emissions, between emissions and the future development of the climate, and between the future development of the climate and the possible economic damages that are usually estimated through uh, um, economic damage function that will, will also be explored in the presentation by Professor Olper later on. Um, we have econometric and statistical based method to try to quantify these negative direct and indirect impacts. And we have the input output approaches that we have just started to, uh, to, uh, to understand. Um, all these methods has, uh, have advantages and drawbacks. In particular, the class of integrated assessment models has been pretty hugely criticized over the last years because uh, um, they, they, they were, uh, they, they, uh, the fault would, would have been to kind of underestimating the possible negative outcomes of climate change and so underestimating the social cost of carbon today. Um, but during the last years, they are facing a number of significant refinement and, and modifications. So there is a huge amount of work to do in these fields. And as you can see, it's important to have a multidisciplinary approach and to be aware about the advantages of the disadvantages of different economic methods, as well as of the advantages and black hole of the other blocks that we have seen. So the climate modeling blocks or the modeling blocks concerning the relationship between the, econom the economic systems and greenhouse gases emission. And this is why I really believe that this multidisciplinary approach of this um, national uh, PhD program is the, the best suited to, uh, to educate the next generation of scholars who will have to deal with these challenges. And that's it. I hope I've been in, in Okay, time. great. Thank yes, thanks, uh, Alessandro. Very much in time. So now I leave uh, the floor to the last speaker, <laughs> Professor Olper. <laughs> Lisa, uh, so I, I, I cannot change. share my, yes. my presentation, please. Here you should. Okay. Uh, Mario, uh, can you allow? Let's see whether Mario is. Uh... Okay. Yes. Just now we can see your presentation. Yes. So now you can. Can you? Now we can see your presentation. Yes, see. Thank you very much. Yes. Floor is yours. Okay, can you see my presentation? Okay. Yes. Thank you, thank you, Lisa, for giving the, giving the floor. Uh, good morning to, to everybody. I am Professor Alessandro Arpel from Milano University, and I will try to, to, to introduce you to something uh, more related to apply works using econometrics. Uh, Econometric model to estimate the impact of climate change, and particularly uh, this is the, the outline of my of my lecture. In the first part, I would try to introduce you to some of the current econometric models that we normally use to estimate the impact of uh, climate change, and also discussing a few 
critical uh, uh, unsolved issues because there are many unsolved issues until now. In the second part, or perhaps in the book part of my presentation, I will try to introduce you to how eventually uh, the reallocation of uh, intersectoral reallocation of labor could eventually represent an important margin of adjustment to climate change. So a sort of adaptation. So basically you can say that uh, as already said by both Alessandro and Mario, especially in the last decade, there has been an explosion of many different uh, study that try to route or investigate the impact of climate change on economic behavior. And one of this uh, approach uh, is uh, the use basically of statistical model or econometric model has been called by, by economists. Uh, we can say that the most modern literature that use econometric uh, approach tend to use panel data and basically panel data, data set the panel where the unit of observation, say, say country, are not just observed across the, all the countries in the world, but are also observed in, in the variation of a certain economic outcome over time. So we have a variation across space and also a variation across time. This kind of uh, um, panel data economically offers some advantages in the identification of the historical impact of climate change, because we can say that this is a sort of ideal research design, simply because uh, basically uh, the, variation, the annual variation or internal variation of a weather variable, say temperature, tend to be exogenous, meaning that uh, uh, economic agents cannot predict uh, which kind of weather uh, will happen in the next month or in the next year. And for that reason, this is a useful property of uh, uh, <clears throat> a variable that we use for explain a certain economic outcome. However, doing that, there are also many problems in using this panel data econometrics for identify the impact of climate change, because uh, if we exploit uh, the variation, for example, of temperature across season or uh, across here, clearly we are basically estimating a sort of short-run model. And if we are estimating a short-run model, um, it is not clear to what extent this model, so the reaction function that we are able to estimate, in reality capture adaptation of economic action. And this is one of the crucial problems. So, uh, it is fundamental that the, the estimated reaction function in one sense are able also to capture adaptation, but using this kind of analytical matrix, uh, we have an either research design, where we are not sure that we are also capturing adaptation. But however, on this point, there are design on the digital group. Until now, uh, many of the papers published on the what now is called the climate econometric basically try to do the following exercise. First of all, they try to estimate an historical relation. For example, the relation between temperature and GDP per capita. And this historical relation is normally called the reaction function based on what happened in the, in the past, for example, 50 years. And then after the estimation of the historical relation, they use this estimation to project future impact of climate change. Basically, they use um, what will happen at the end of the century in terms of the increase in temperature, and they use the historical action factor. They will they try to project the economic impact at the end of the century. Now, to better explain this uh, kind of uh, activity by uh, uh, economic researcher, I will try to present to you an example. This is a quite famous example because it is one of the most famous papers until now published on this kind of issue. At least one of the most used in after integrated assessment model to build the match function. This is the paper of Burke, Exian, and Miguel that basically uh, estimate an historical reaction function. Uh, the function is the one uh, reported in the slide, but it is important that you focus the attention only on the first two terms. So forgot the, the other uh, value in the quiz because I'm just control for behind of this, of this lecture. So the dependent variable, delta y at t, it is just the GDP per capita. So because there is delta, it is the growth of GDP per capita. 
And the function H is the function is a quadratic function of temperature. So it means that the temperature enters both linearly and as a square term. So the rest of the equation I said before, is just control error, not usual for us. Basically, starting from uh, an historical uh, data set in the, this paper, the, the, the data start in 1960 and end in 2010, they estimate the reaction function H. And starting from the estimated reaction function, the author normally try to project the future impact of climate change with a very, in a very simple way. I don't want to enter in the detail of this second equation, but it's a very simple uh, application of what's happened in the past. Uh, now, the point is that when we project in the future, our historical reaction function, basically we are assuming that uh, in the next uh, 70 or 80 years, the economy will behave as happened in the past 50 years. And I think that is quite interesting that this, this is a strong assumption. Because for example, suppose that take the case of the COVID-19, and clearly in the, in the next future, future many shocks will happen in our economy, and particularly uh, innovation shock. Is the, the, the pattern of innovation change the direction with respect to the actual one? And there are many, many problems that will happen, happen in, the, in the future. Uh, the historical reaction function is not representative of what could really happen in the future. So, in the paper of Burker and co author, they estimated a world loss at the end of the century using this machinery of about 20-30% of real GDP using uh, the RCP scenario, this is one of the most strong RCP scenarios. So meaning that the scenario normally called business usual and it basically means a strong emission scenario. Uh, the results from the paper of Burke and co-author is strongly heterogeneous across continent and also across country. In the, uh, in the link report at the bottom of the slide, you can see also the impact to every single country used in this uh, application. Here we can see that clearly in the south of the world, the demand estimated from this uh, exercise is significantly strong because we have a demand of more than 80% of reduction in GDP at the end of the century. But if we consider the north of the world, for example, Europe, we have an increase of about 50% at the end of the century, but in the North America, basically nothing happened. Now, the point is, and this is a central point of my presentation, the question is, how can we believe to this result? How can we believe that in the, at the end of the center, century, the, the, the major in this continent of the world are the one estimated by this paper. This, is, this question is important because the projection, as I said before, are based on a strong assumption about the ability of economies to adapt to climate change. And so there are at least, at least two critical questions. First of all, to what extent the projection accounts for adaptation? And this clearly depends by, by the ability of, of our historical estimation of the reaction function to capture what's happened in the past in terms of adaptation. And the second point is related to the fact that it's important for us to understand the mechanism throughout eventually economic agents or the economic overall adapt to climate change. And this kind of extra basically say nothing about these two points. So to try to learn more and basically propose you an example, uh, I <clears throat> develop a simple model to show you how eventually there could be a, a adaptation throughout the labor market. To do that, I basically start from the following example. So that there is a, a, a labor productivity shock in the economy. Normally, climate change, we know that climate change 
has a heterogeneous aspect at the factorial level. For example, the agricultural sector is significantly more affected than non agricultural sector. Clearly, also in the manufacturing industry, there are sectors more affected than others. But if we take a simple economy with three sectors, normally the agricultural sector is more affected than the manufacturing and the services sector. So start from this uh, uh, starting point. Then, this heterogeneous effect in sectoral productivity basically can trigger several different margins of adjustment, inducing, for example, change in the international trade patterns. There are uh, a growing issue to try to figure out what's happening in terms of the changing comparative advantage and how international trade could eventually change and so internalize the impact of climate change. This kind of heterogeneous effect could trigger migration. There is a huge literature on climate change and migration, and the results are quite mixed. And finally, this kind of uh, heterogeneous effect could uh, induce labor reallocation across sectors. Now, in the next part of my, of my presentation, I will try to give you a simple example of how an economy could, could adapt throughout reallocation in the labor market. Now, I will start from a very, very simple model. This is an economy based on two sectors, one agricultural sector and the other is the non-agricultural sector, called, for example, the manufacturing sector. Now, every economic model normally starts from initial condition and initial equilibrium. We assume that the economy normally are in equilibrium. In this kind of initial equilibrium, in this two uh, sector economy, the wage uh, are equalized across sector. So in the agricultural sector, A, the wage is identical to the manufacturing on non-agricultural sector. Pay attention because in this kind of model, this is the standard specific factor model, the wage is just equal to the price of the marginal productivity. Now, in the initial equilibrium, we can represent graphically our economy with a very simple graph. In this graph, in the vertical axis, we measure the wage, and in the horizontal axis, we measure the amount of labor in the two sectors. Well, the agricultural sector, the origin of the agricultural sector here on the left, and the origin of the manufacturing sector is on the right of the horizontal axis. So basically, the two depicted curves are the, uh, <clears throat> the labor demand in the agricultural sector and the labor demand in the non-agricultural sector. When the two curves cross, we have the initial equilibrium. And so in the initial equilibrium, we have a certain level of wage and a certain amount of worker employed in agriculture and a certain amount of worker employed in the non-agricultural sector. Now, if we include a possible climate shock in this model, we can assume that uh, basically there is a climate-driven productivity shock that happens mainly in the agricultural sector because there are a huge of evidence that shows us that normally the climate shock primarily affects the agricultural sector. This kind of climate driven productivity shock, basically, in this kind of model, will push workers into the non agricultural sector, has an effect of the change in local comparative advantage. Basically, graphically, what's happened is that the climate shock will push down the productivity in the agricultural sector. And if we assume that nothing, nothing happened in the non agricultural sector, the demand of labor will uh, <clears throat> shift down from the black one, that is the initial equilibrium, to the red one, that is the final equilibrium. As can you see in the, in the simple model, a shift down of the labor demand in the agricultural sector will induce, first of all, a reduction of the wage. The wage will move from the initial W to W third. And also, and this is an important point, in a reallocation of labor. So a contraction, a reduction of the amount of labor used in the agricultural sector because there is a reduction in the labor demand and an expansion of labor in the non-agricultural sector. 
Now, what are the implications of this labor reallocation induced eventually by, cli by a climate shock? First of all, the labor reallocation is crucial for our ability to measure the climate change economic impacts. So basically we can say that uh, do, not, do not considering this form of adaptation because the labor allocation can be viewed as a form of adaptation, our ability to estimate the impact of climate change is significantly higher because, because we are omitting our agents, our economic agents adapt to the productivity shock. This clearly is, it is an oversimplified model. And uh, at the end, what we are interested in what really happens in the reality. So the point is how this model can be eventually estimated with the real data. Basically to estimate this kind of uh, uh, of labor, we need at the minimum to test to key relationship. First of all, we need to understand how sectoral growth and wage are eventually differentially affected by climate change shock. And secondly, how the present effect change the sectoral demand of labor. And so inducing a reallocation of labor from the most affected agricultural sector to the lower sector, sector like the manufacturing and services sector. So basically, the first application of this simple model has been done recently by a paper of Corner using uh, the Indian state's labor market. And the results of this paper are very interesting because basically they show that the ability of a non-agricultural sector to absorb workers has been crucial in mitigating the impact of the uh, climate-driven agricultural productivity shock. Importantly, in this, uh, in the empirical estimation of this paper, they show that the, in the absence of this labor, labor allocation from the agricultural sector to the manufacturing and services sector, the local economic loss could be up to 7% higher with respect to we find normally. So basically, this is a clear signal that if we are not able in our model to capture also adaptation, Probably we have overestimated the damage from climate change. There are other, other written papers that more or less show that there is this labor allocation induced by climate change. But the point here is that uh, what's happening in rich countries, because I said before, this kind of application that uh, predicts the relocation of labor from agriculture to the manufacturing sector normally uh, work well in a, a de developing or in emerging country where the share of labor in the agricultural sector is very high. The question is to what extent a model like this could be eventually exploited for understanding what are going on in rich countries, a country like Italy or European country or European regions. From this point of view, there is just one application, a recent application for a Yuki that used as an example the US county, in particular the US Corn Belt counties. That are a US area where there is a, a, an abundance of corn production. Basically, in this uh, empirical application, the author showed that the net effect of one standard deviation increase in temperature induced a 6.9% decline in the early wage for the average US worker, agricultural worker. And this effect is similar or close of what are going on in developing countries. And this is interesting because we are trying to apply something of similar to uh, um, basically to the Mediterranean EU regions at the NAS2 and NAS3 level to try to understand at uh, which point the climate shock that induced uh, a reduction in agricultural productivity basically induced a formal relocation like the one summarized by, uh, by our simple model. Well, already some preliminary results uh, that concern only Italy, 
And the preliminary results are encouraging because what we find in the data is exactly what predicted by the model. Clearly, Italy is not enough, especially because we are interested in a crucial project question, and particularly we're interested in understand to what extent this labor reallocation in some sense could also depend by the flexibility or rigidity of the labor market institution. In Europe, there is some heterogeneity in this uh, labor, in, in, in the regulation of the labor market. And so we, we hope to exploit this heterogeneity in the labor market institution to see if the labor allocation is different or not depending by the flexibility or the rigidity. So this is more or less uh, the end of my presentation. <laughs> And uh, if you have any kind of question, please uh, do not hesitate to, to ask me. Thank you very much for uh, your attention. Okay, that is uh, uh, very good. And I think it's a um, deep dive into some of the economics uh, jargon. I hope everyone was uh, able yeah, to. I no, that's fine. I, I think uh, uh, I also had some like basics explanation of some of the jargon already in the chat but of course if there are questions we have like five minutes left so there's uh, there's of course there's uh, questions in the chat but also since we have five minutes uh, left perhaps we can take one question or from the, from the audience or through the chat uh, i don't know how you prefer do any clarification from the audience I see comments. I think on the chat, there are many questions that have been already answered. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I, I don't know. I mean, if you don't have any, I don't see hands being raised. So you can use the hands raised uh, function if you want to, don't be shy. I mean, we're here to learn. So it don't, you shouldn't be shy at all. Um, okay, still, I don't see hands raised. So if you have more questions, uh, just uh, put them on the chat. Uh, and otherwise I would probably leave you the time for lunch. We are perfectly in time. And so that is great for me, I mean, as a chair. <laughs> and I think the presentations have been uh, very helpful and, and clear. Um, but of course, again, if you have questions, especially for non-economists, uh, sometimes we don't exactly know what you know you understand and what is obvious. So please let us know uh, either now or later. Um, there is a uh, There's just the yeah, yeah. There's one question. Do you do you think that the calculations for economic impact of CC uh, should be standardized to all companies or entities? This is for a uh, Professor Alper. Yes, I, I think no, like uh, honestly, I don't know how it is possible to make this kind of standardization. I don't see how, to be honest. And uh, in general, we are quite far for a better figure out uh, what are the real economic impact of climate change. And we need time. Yeah, and one thing that you will learn through this uh, PhD program, of course, is that firms yeah. are very heterogeneous and also they're not rational actors. So, so there's a whole lot of complexities, uh, uh, not just systemic uh -huh. ones, but also we, we don't have to assume that firms are like one kind and uh, they can be uh, somehow, you know, there are some yes, stylized sure. facts about how economies work and typologies of firm also are, exist, but firms are very different one from the other and they also react differently based on a number of characteristics both internal resources but other issues as well so this is something you are going to be learning through this um, three years course i think uh, besides other things uh, okay so if there's no further question uh, any of the speakers want to have a final word or they want to say something Yeah, okay, so I will uh, then uh, now call uh, the lunch break and uh, meet you again at two thirty, right? Yes, yeah. this is the schedule. Okay, see you later and have see a nice later. lunch. Thank have you. a break. Thanks, Bye. everybody. See you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you to the speakers. Bye. Thank you, Lisa.